It's good to see everybody here this morning. Who's full of barbecue and pork from the river this week? I guess I'm alone. Anybody else? Just, okay, amen. Praise the Lord. It's good to see everybody. I want to ask prayer uh, from you guys this week. I'll be leaving on Saturday, going to YWAM Kona and ministering for a few days. Really excited about this mission trip, just being able to minister to tons of young people that have devoted their life to missions and to ministry. I'm excited about it. Be leaving Saturday morning. We'll be back sometime at the end of next week, and I'm really excited about it. So just be praying for us. Pray for my wife. I don't know how she gets by without me, I tell you. <laughs> no, she just said that's a vacation for her. I don't I'm just kidding. It's actually the other way around. Well, here we are. We saw a story unfold these last seven weeks. We watched a dying man preach the most powerful sermon that's ever been preached through his seven statements that he said on the cross. And last week, we saw Jesus take his last breath and leave this earth from the cross. Usually, though, when someone draws their last breath, that's the end. But this morning, I want to tell you, as Paul Harvey says, the rest of the story. When Jesus breathed his last on the cross, let me tell you, it was not over. It was not the end. It was only the beginning of something great, especially for you and I. As Jesus took his last breath from the cross, all of hell celebrated. A man named Joseph of Arimathea came and took his body and put it in his own tomb. And the disciples dispersed, thinking their ministry, their livelihood, and everything they've done the last three and a half years were over. The Pharisees were kind of scared. They told the guard, to put a guard around the tomb because they remembered something Jesus said that he would raise in three days and they didn't want people to take his body and to start a fictitious rumor. But then after the third day, it's like that song, the ground began to shake. And the stone was rolled away and death was beaten. You know, we talk a lot, and I have talked a lot about the cross these last seven weeks. But without the empty tomb, without a risen Lord, we are nothing more than a dead religion, without a risen Lord. But let me tell you, it's the cornerstone of our faith, and without a doubt, He is risen, and so shall He evermore be. We serve a risen Lord. And then, After the third day, I'm not going to belabor this point. I know you know this. I want to focus on something different this morning. This morning, I'm going to be focusing on, and I'm calling this sermon, the final word. Because this series I've called Famous Last Words. These seven things that Jesus said from the cross. We've taken them one by one and learned by what he was trying to tell us as his followers through those things and extrapolating those principles out of it. Well, this morning, I want to focus on the final word. After he rose, he met with his disciples. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew chapter 28, and you can also thumb over to Acts chapter 1 because we're going to be getting there. That's where we'll land this morning. I don't know what it is when you fly as well. I'm not scared at all. I used to be terrified of flying. Every time I take a mission trip, the movie Castaway is shown like every single day on the television. Watched it last night, I'm like, that's almost where I'm going. This is ridiculous. But we don't have fear. Acts, uh, Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Jesus has risen from the grave after three days in the grave, and he has now appeared to his disciples, and he's about to tell them something. He's about to give them orders, marching orders, because of what he's done. Because of the sermon that Christ preached from the cross, you and I have things that we have to do. Yes. If it's just somebody preaching a sermon and we're not taking those principles and applying them to our lives, 
There's something else we could be doing that morning. The Word of God is true, and we are to gear our life by it. And Jesus, now risen, is congregated with his disciples in Matthew chapter 28. And it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee because Jesus told him to meet there. It's not that they were standing in faith. We knew he was going to rise from the dead. We'll be in Galilee waiting on you. No, two ladies came to a tomb and found it and said, hey, go round up those guys that had dispersed everywhere and tell them to meet me in Galilee. <laughs> That's what he did. And here he is in Galilee, and Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they were, they worshipped him, but some doubted. I want you to imagine just drinking that in for a moment. As a follower of Jesus, you watched from afar, from a hiding place, watching Jesus die on a cross. You watched them take his body down from the cross. And now three days later, he's standing right in front of you. Not, not in the spirit. He, he is standing physically right in front of you, and you are beholding him with your natural eyes. Just drink that in for a moment. Man, those guys had it made, didn't they? What a wonderful experience to behold in the flesh the risen Jesus. Man, I would have given anything to see that. He's, he's alive nonetheless. I believe even though I haven't seen I know it's true I, and all of that. But what a great sight that had to be. Some of them doubted. Imagine, I, that just doesn't make sense to me. Okay, here we are 2,000 years through this chasm of time. And some, did that really happen? Of course it did. Yes, it did. But they were seeing it with their own eyes, and some of them doubted. While looking at Jesus, they doubted. Not they doubted if he was going to show up. They were looking at him, but they doubted. And Jesus says this, All, say all, authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. When he conquered death, hell, and the grave, that was it. All authority was placed into the hands of Jesus. He says four verbs for us to do, four action verbs. Go, therefore. Say go. Go, therefore, and make. Say make. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing. Say baptizing. baptizing. Them in the name of the Father. See, you're helping me preach. The Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching. Say teaching. Them, what? Tuck in my pocket. My wife, she's cleaning me up. Thank you, baby. You make me look good in so many different ways. I'm sorry. I've done the best I can. She's trying to clean me up. Jesus is now appearing to his disciples, and he says, Go and make disciples, baptize them, teach them all that I have observed with you, and behold, I'm with you till the end of the age. When was that statement uttered? Just look back. Let's, let's do a little math. I don't know the exact year calendars have changed. It's been over 2,000 years ago. Right at 2,000 years ago that this statement was made. How many parents, if you told your child to do something, and one day went by without them doing it. 2,000 years has taken, this is gone, and this has yet to be accomplished. I'm not saying it hasn't been done, efforts haven't been made, but the evangelization of the world has not been completed. There are still unreached people groups that have not heard the name of Jesus. I've had the privilege to step in some of the most remote areas of the world and utter the name of Jesus to someone who has never heard his name before. It's an honor. But it's not accomplished. And my question to you today is why? Why has it not been done? Do you know how many churches are even in Marshall County? I did a demographic survey one time. At that time, it's been, gosh, it's been 10 years ago. At that time, there were 85 churches within Marshall County. How many churches did you pass this morning on the way to get to this church? 
a bunch. You have the first church of this, the second church, the third church. New beginnings. We have all these creative names. But the truth is, we have access to the gospel message. Assuming that churches are preaching the gospel, which I give you, is a huge assumption. Some places don't have one. Not one. Why has this not been accomplished? America has been so desensitized to the gospel. It's not that we haven't heard. It's that we've heard and either rejected or have turned callous to hearing it when there's some that haven't heard it once. Why? Why are we not sold out as His believers? We've also encountered a risen Lord. We've not seen it in the flesh, but we know He's alive. We know that there's a heaven. We know that there's a hell. We know that there's a risen Savior who died on the cross to cover our sins. We know He rose from the grave. He's the first amongst the resurrected. And we find ourselves in Him. Why are we not doing what He told us to do? You know, I'm glad you asked that question because it's what I'm preaching on this morning. See how that lined up? Acts chapter 1. I've got three reasons, and I want you to examine your hearts this morning because I've examined mine, and I have found myself guilty. Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Everybody following me so far? Good. I'll preach to you five that are following. Verse 6. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? These guys, let me just give you a little history. They followed Jesus for selfish reasons. I know that you've never done that. But they did. I'm not saying they didn't believe upon him. They didn't know that he was the rabbi, that he was the Messiah. They had this... Thing on them. It was Roman oppression. And they wanted to have a free Israel. Thank God we in this country still have freedom. At least right now. Not can't promise you it will be there tomorrow, but it is right now. You are able to come in here this morning. We have freedom. They were oppressed by Rome. And there was soldier station everywhere. They were not a free nation. And the entire time they were following Jesus in, the, in his ministry, they kept asking this question, when are you going to do it? Because they knew that if we followed Christ, one day they would be gone. And he started talking about these thrones that they would sit on with him. They never got what the kingdom actually was. Okay, I'm ready. I'm ready for it. Let's sit on some thrones. Let's get rid of Rome. Let's, let's have the coup d'etat. Let's get this thing done. Jesus died on a cross, rose from the grave, commissioned them for what would be their life's work. Go, make, baptize, teach. Go, make, baptize, teach. Go, make, baptize, teach. And they're there, hey, Jesus, but I really, really want this. He's about to ascend into heaven. And their question is, I still want what I want. Now, Jesus, I, yeah, I get it. You died on a cross. Yes, you rose from the grave. I see that. But I want what I want. Can I have it now? Imagine being Jesus at this point. Oy vey. My first point is this. We've not fulfilled what Christ has told us to do because, number one, we've come to Him with our agenda and not based on His terms. So I want you to examine yourself this morning. A lot of times when we come to Christ, we see Him as a means. 
to getting what we really want. And we have these requests. Everybody in this building has this long list of things they would like Jesus to do for them. And my question to you is, does that affect your allegiance towards him? Because if it does, we're wrong. Sometimes it does. God, I want this so bad. Jesus, I want this. And when he doesn't give it to us, we get disillusioned with him and we get angry with him. That's where they were. Jesus, now can we have it? Now? You've resurrected from the grave. Can I have it now? Will you do it now? I'm so sick of Rome. Get them out of here. I want it now. So indicative of us as his followers. Because I'll be honest, I have failed at this a lot. There's a lot of times I wouldn't tell you with my mouth, but my loyalty, not necessarily loyalty, but my passion to Christ was in direct correlation with what he could give me. Let me tell you something. He's not a vending machine. He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords that is worthy of all of your devotion. We need to get to that place like those three Hebrew children who were thrown into a fire. You remember that? They were thrown into a fire, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were in there and it's like, hey, deliver us, God. Said, I'll tell you what, you bow your knee to me. It'll all be over. He says one thing that's so profound yet so simple. They said, we know that God is able to do this. Let me tell you, he is. But the second point, he says, but even if he doesn't do what we want him to do, we still won't. That's my question to you. What if he never answers your request the way that you want it answered? Will it affect your loyalty to him? It shouldn't because he's the king to be served. We're servants in the house of the Lord. Then why has this commission that he's given us not taken place? Because a lot of us have failed at that. Not necessarily our loyalty. We we believe that he's the Lord. He's our fire insurance to get out of hell. But, I'm not going over there and doing that until he does this for me. Good luck with that. I have never won a bargaining war with God one time. Maybe you found some secret, but I can't. He is the Lord. He will do what he wants. And he loves you. It's not that he's holding back his goodness from you. Don't, Don't misinterpret that. He loves you. But it should not affect our allegiance to him. First reason is we come to him on our agenda. He said to them this. What a brilliant answer. I, as my dad says, the spirit of slap would have come all over me. I would have lined him up and just come here. (laughs) Don't you get this? But he didn't do that. He answers this, which is my second point. It's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. Say that with me. Let's read that together. It's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. One more time, because you really need to believe that. It's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father has fixed by His own authority. I wrote something on Facebook not too long ago. If you walked into a room, and all that's in this room is a table, and there's a present on the table wrapped up in a beautiful bow, but there's no name on it, would you open the present? Some of us would, because we like presents. It's not for you to know. My second point is this. We have made the Bible some type of cryptic mystery instead of simple words to obey. The Bible is simple. It is simple words for us to obey. But we have disagreements one with another. We'll spend years arguing, who was Cain's wife? Did Adam have a belly button? I want to know! I 
I don't think he did, by the way, but it's no reason for us to argue about it. Why are we arguing about if Adam had a belly button when Jesus simply said, go, make, baptize, teach? But I want to know, did he have a navel? And I'm not against end time study, okay? I'm not talking about not studying the end time. But can I tell you my heart towards it? I know Jesus is coming. And I don't really care. I wake up, you mean you don't need to, I don't need to know. I wake up every morning and I say, Jesus, I'm yours 100% today and I pray you come back today. But if you don't, I'm going to occupy till you come. I'm going to be the best I can be for you. And if not, I'll see you tomorrow. Is it pre-tribulation rapture? Is it mid -tri I don't care. I just want Jesus to come. And I know he's coming. Some of you disagree with me, and I'll get emails over that statement. Type away. I'm telling you, live your best for Jesus. He made it simple for you. This is not some mystery to figure out. It's simple and clear. My dad always said this about Brother Parrish. He said a lot of people, they take really, really simple things and they add a lot of fancy words and they make them so hard to understand. He said Brother Parrish had an ability to take just the most difficult, complex things and make it so simple where somebody in West Kentucky can read it and understand it and obey it. Let me tell you, that, he was an expert at that. Because that's what the Bible is. It's simple things that he meant for you and I to understand and to apply and to obey. Do you have everything figured out, Richie? No. Do I have to have it figured out to give him my allegiance and obedience? No. When's Jesus coming back, Richie? I don't know. Guess what? Neither does he. Jesus says only the Father knows. Did he not say that? If you've got that figured out, you've got something Jesus doesn't know. Congratulations. Let it go and give him your allegiance and obey what he told you to do. There we go. First thing, we come to him on our agenda, not on his terms. The second thing, we see the Bible as a mystery instead of a simple thing to obey and here's where I really want to land today because this is difficult he says but you will receive power oh it's the charismatic credo we all know this we got tattoos of it on our back but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses my third thing that I suggest to you, we're not witnesses because we've not had a true encounter with the Holy Spirit. Jesus said it straightforward and simple. When you encounter the Holy Spirit and His power comes upon you, it's simple. You will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. He later said in the God or previously said in the Gospels that when the Helper comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, He will bear witness about me. Don't believe He said it? John chapter 15, look it up. That's what He said. I'm telling you, when you've encountered the Holy Spirit, it's immediate. You become this radical evangelist for Jesus. You've got to tell people about Jesus. Why is that? Because that's what the Holy Spirit's function is. And somewhere along the way, and I'm not against this. Here comes another email. Somewhere along the way, as charismatics, we've been more concerned with dancing in the river than we have been with saving drowning people. Uh-oh. 
I know, I can hear the clicking right now, texting. All, I will have email. And I'm not against it. The Holy Spirit will bless you. He will refresh you. The spirit of joy, the new wine will pour out, yes. But if you've encountered the Holy Spirit, you won't be able to shut up about Jesus. Because that's what he came for. He said, I will send you the helper. And when he pours upon you, you will be my witnesses. Man, I remember, I've told this story a thousand times, you, you get to hear it again. You're blessed. I remember the night that I had a touch from the Holy Spirit for the first time. Oh, it was awesome. Once again, I was 17 years old. I found myself a cocky teenager. I was the only cocky teenager to ever live. I had grown up in a Pentecostal church. I had seen the movement of the Holy Spirit. And I was sitting back there about where Brother Chuck sits right now. And this guy got up and he gave an invitation to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I kind of bucked up and I said, okay, God, if this is real, here's your one shot. Anybody ever done that besides me? Get, okay, I'm sorry. That's what I did. I was 17. I was a cocky teenager. And I came up here and this man prayed for me. And I found myself on the floor right where Scott's sitting right here. I was a lot smaller then, didn't take up as much space on the floor. And I felt waves of the Holy Spirit just washing over me. Began to speak in other tongues. Began to just praise the Lord in my spirit. He just did a washing of me. The next day, man, I was working at Dairy Queen with Charlie and Wilma. I don't know why they hired me. They must have really liked my parents. but They liked my parents and I really liked their ice cream. It was a good mixture. Next night, I considered myself a closet Christian. I was in the dining room mopping. Didn't do a very good job then either, Jenny. Nothing's changed. And I'm mopping, and I started singing and worshiping the Lord. I had never done that in my entire life. And this guy comes up to me, captain of the football team of Marshall County High School. He said, what's that you're singing? And I thought, uh-oh, I'm busted. Jesus done snuck out of my life a little bit. And I said, let me tell you about Jesus. He has changed my life. First time I ever witnessed in my life. Where did that come from? Because I had encountered the Holy Spirit. And I couldn't shut up about how great Jesus was. And I became this witness for Jesus. That night, him and I were cleaning a stinky urinal in Dairy Queen. On our knees in the bathroom. I wouldn't get on my knees in the bathroom for nothing. And I grabbed his hand, and I led that man to Jesus in the floor of Dairy Queen. Where did that come from? I had encountered the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, church, now more than ever, we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in His church. Why? So He will bless us? Yes. But so we will go in the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, Richie, that's just you, is it? Turn over to the next chapter. Look at Peter. Remember him? Brady Cat? Little girl comes up. Do you know Jesus? You're one of him. You talk just like him. Said, I've never heard the man. Another little girl comes up. You're one of them. I saw you. No, not me. I'm scared. The Holy Spirit pours out. Tongues of fire and people think they're drunk. And Peter stands up and says, Ladies and gentlemen, we are not drunk as it's only the third hour. But let me tell you, him who you crucified, he is risen from the grave. Something happened in that man. Well, Richie, I'm scared. I'm not an evangelist. That's not my spiritual gifting. If you've encountered the power of the Holy Spirit, there's no more questions about, I'm not an evangelist. You won't be able to shut up about Jesus. Why? Because Jesus says, when the Holy Spirit comes up on you, you will be my witnesses. It doesn't say you might be. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, let's get into a class and let's divvy up spiritual gifting. No, he said, you won't be able to stop talking about me. Now more than ever, church, 
We need the power of the Holy Spirit in this place. You need the power of the Holy Spirit in your place. You're desperate without Him. You're impotent without Him. You have forfeited your mission. Let me tell you, every person, like I said last week, that you will see today is somehow on their way to an eternal destiny. They will either enter into their rest and spend eternity in the presence of God, or they will spend an eternity dying in hell for how they lived a small second because they rejected Him. We don't have time to sit around and argue about nonsense when there's a world going to hell. It's time we receive the power of the Holy Spirit. We become refreshed. It's like a checking account. It's not a savings account. If you have a good savings account, we don't. <laughs> but if you do, you just keep putting in there. Now let's save up. $10 each month, $50 each month. Keep packing it up. It just keeps stacking and stacking and stacking. Then all of a sudden you can buy the world with your massive savings account. But a checking account's different. Every week, you get a paycheck. Deserved or not, you still get one. Gets in your checking account. What do you do? You go buy groceries. Probably spend a little more than you should. You go put gas, and thank God gas is back around $2 a gallon. Thank you, Jesus. Put gas in. Takes a little bit out of the checking account. Pay the electric bill. Takes a little bit out of the checking account. Have to pay the car payment. Uh-oh. That's a little bit more than I had in my checking account. Oh, I'll cover it on Monday. I'm getting paid again. That's how it is with the Holy Spirit. It's a continual pouring in and a going out. Pouring in and a going out. Pouring in and a going out. Why do we come to church? So you can get more and more and more and more. Corporately, get more and more and more and more. Get filled up with the Holy Spirit. Used to be signs over those doors as we walked out. I wish we could, somebody this week, get out there, put those signs back. You are now entering the mission field. I wish those signs were still on that door. There you go, Damien. Paint them this week, brother. Look, you just got a job. <laughs> Why is that? Because as we get more, we go out. We reach, we reach, we reach. We go, we make, we baptize, we teach. We come back, we get filled up with the Holy Spirit. We go, we make, we baptize, we teach. We come back, we get more. He refreshes you along the way. The spirit of joy is poured out. Praise the Lord. Then you go. Then you make. Then you baptize. Then you teach. And then he's faithful. The next day he comes in and praise God. His spirit pours out on you again and you go. But instead, as Christians, we've built this incredibly large savings account with nowhere to spend it. Go. Make. Baptize. And teach. Why has the Great Commission not been accomplished? That's the, what we're talking about today. Why? Number one, we've come to Jesus on our agenda, not on His terms. Number two, and I'm out of breath because I'm out of shape. Don't you judge me. Number two, we've made the Bible a mystery instead of simple obedience. Number three, we have misused, blah, blah, misused and abused the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if we've encountered the true Holy Spirit, we will go, we will make, we will baptize, we will teach. Stand to your feet this morning. I love you. If you feel condemned, forgive me, this is not a condemning sermon. I'm just sharing with you what the Lord's convicted me about this week. Father, in the name of Jesus, this morning, Lord, as the shepherd of this flock, Lord, I confess my own failures. Lord, there's been often times that my passion and loyalty has been dependent on my agenda. And this morning, I lay it at your feet. And I say, Lord Jesus, even if you don't, I will still serve you. I will still go. I will still make. I will still baptize. I will still teach. I will honor you in my life, Jesus even if my agenda is not met.
Father, forgive me for arguing on points that's not essential to the gospel. Father, you've made the Bible clear and succinct and succinct and something simple for us to obey. And Lord, I'm not talking about anyone else. I'm talking about Richie. Forgive me, Lord, for not harnessing the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, when you poured out in Acts chapter 2, there was an explosion of evangelism. That one pouring out, 3,000 people came in because the Holy Spirit was poured out. Lord, I have been selfish with the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I have not harnessed its power to evangelize. Lord, you said when the Holy Spirit comes, you will bear witness about you. Father, I've not done that. Father, I pray for a spirit of evangelism to erupt in Christian Fellowship Church, Father. Lord, right now, God, I pray that this place right here would become a beacon to this community, Father. Lord, and as we come in, as we get filled up, Father, as we get filled up in our prayer closet every day, it doesn't have to be in this place, in the prayer meetings, Father, on Wednesday night, on other groups, Father, pour your Spirit out. Lord, we pray for a fresh wind of your Spirit in this place. Lord, personally and corporately, but what I pray more than anything, Jesus, is that your name would go forth from this place. Lord, and that these disciples here this morning, Father, Lord, if they go to Christian Fellowship School, if they go to a public high school, Father, if they are a beacon at Murray State University or West Kentucky, whatever it's called, Father, if it's a workplace, whatever it is, Lord, may your name go forth with power again. Jesus, let us be bearers of your name. And Lord, I pray that as we go, your word would be fulfilled, that signs and wonders would follow every person, Father, as they go. That signs and wonders, more of the power of the Holy Spirit would be poured out, Jesus, in our lives. Lord, I pray for healings in the community, Lord. Healings in Walmart, Father. Healings in the workplace, Jesus. I pray for supernatural, Lord. Just manifestations of your presence, Father. Lord, I pray that people here this week, Lord, they will go out carrying your name, Lord, and you will honor it with signs and wonders, Father, in the name of Jesus. And may your name go forth more. Lord, we want to carry your name. And I ask you right now, Jesus, that we do it better than we have before. And that we yell your name louder than we did before, Jesus. And we live a life, Lord, that's worthy to be called a Christian. Lord, purify your people and pour out your spirit again, Lord. Pour out your spirit again. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to ask this question this morning. If you would like to join me, I'm not saying you're not a Christian. That's not what I'm talking about. But if you would like to join me this morning and you would say this, exactly what we've talked about. I make myself available to Jesus. And what you're saying by coming to this altar is this. I'm available to Jesus. I will go. I will make. I will baptize. I will teach. I will obey the Lord. I drop my own agenda. I come to Him on His terms. And I make myself available. But I need more of the Holy Spirit to accomplish His purpose in my life. I'm empty and I need the Holy Spirit and I make myself available. I will go. If that's you, I want you to fill these altars this morning. We're going to make a prayer dedication this morning together.